You guys have been so good to, uh, so as to have uh, submitted these questions, and there were certainly some interesting questions there. Let me tell you. Um, so obviously, I know we'd only be able to get to a certain amount of questions, so, um, but the good news is that maybe toward the end of next month, we'll do this again, and maybe we'll just do this uh, as we go along to keep questions cooking, and then we'll answer them as we go. How's that sound? Okay. Now, um, Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29 says that the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that are revealed to us are revealed for us and for our children. So there are some things that are just going to fall into, gee, the answer is, I don't know, because... God has not revealed that. That's just what he does sovereignly. It's what he's chosen to do, and that's the end of the story. You can't always make sense of it. He's just chosen to do that. And some of these uh, answers that I'm going to give you tonight have to be kind of bathed in that concept, with that concept in mind, uh, because it really doesn't matter if I give my opinion what we want is something that's either clear from Scripture or not clear from Scripture. But there are some things that are in the middle. There's some clarity, but then there's also another position to be taken on the other side of the same coin. So with that in mind, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord. You know, that's a big Scripture that you may hear several times as we go along here, all right? But I'm going to literally read the questions uh, that you submitted, and we'll look at some scriptures together, all right, as we answer these things. Um, there were three questions that are very, very similar in nature, so let me read you the questions, and you'll see how similar they were. Um, if once saved, always saved is not a truth, then how easy or difficult is it for a person to lose their salvation? Second person wrote, once saved, always saved. Question, what about the person who turns away from God and lives in the world, although they came forward to an altar call years prior to that? And then the third question was, can you contrast the idea that some people have of once saved, always saved with the following scriptures? And they gave a couple of scriptures. Um, to go along with that. So the answer is that our position here that we see in Scripture is that this issue, and you're going to hear this fancy term called eternal security, and we don't believe in that position here. We don't believe once saved, always saved, that you can go forward to some altar call somewhere, and that's it. You're all set now, and it really doesn't matter how you live for the rest of your life. We don't believe that's consistent with a hundred other scriptures that you find in the Gospels as well as the epistles about holiness, about righteousness, about pursuing the Lord, about doing his will, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, let me just quickly add that we're not trying to say in that that it's something flimsy that if you have a bad day, week, month, that all of a sudden, you know, you're on the bubble of getting cut. We're not trying to say that salvation is a flimsy thing. It's a very secure thing, and it's a very solid thing. However, it's not an issue of Jesus losing us, because he's well able to keep us. The issue is not him losing us. The issue is somebody walking away from him. You understand the, the, the difference there? The issue is not his ability to keep us, because he says in his word, Lord, I thank you, you know, that, that we're well able to keep the souls that you've given. That's not, the, that's not the issue. The issue is this. Let me give you some principles. Number one, that when we talk about um, this issue of eternal security, number one, it's inconsistent with the concept of free will, to hold that position. 
You understand that if God lays out a major concept, you'll find it, you'll be able to see it throughout the Old Testament, into the New, and all the way through. There'll be a consistency in terms of its application. Now, it's inconsistent. I want you to think about this. How many of you know that you and I have free will tonight? That you came here tonight ostensibly because you chose to. Guess what? That was an act of free will. You got dressed and went to work today or whatever you did because it was an act of your free will. You came to church tonight and you worshiped the Lord because it was an act of your free will. Right? And we can go on and on with these rhetorical questions. So I want you to bring you this when you talk about consistency of revelation. If free will is this comprehensive, monstrous gift that God has given us, it's inconsistent to think that it applies to every other area of life except choose this day whom you'll serve. When Joshua himself said it, notice Joshua didn't say choose this day whom you'll believe, believe in. He said choose this day whom you will serve. And uh, James even said, faith without works is dead. In the Greek, that means faith without works is but a corpse. In fact, James questions whether or not someone is even saved if there's not some good works, if their life is not changing, if they're not doing good works as a consequence of a changed heart. James questions even whether or not their faith is real and their salvation itself is real. Now, I want you to look at some scriptures with me. Can we do that? Let's go together to 2 Peter chapter 2. We'll just look at a handful of scriptures because some of these other questions will be shorter and we can answer them in a sentence or two. But this one, I felt it grossly unfair just to say yes or no without building a case scripturally for you to understand why we believe this is the position of scripture. 2 Peter chapter 2. Now, there's some fine scholars and fine churches that, that believe to the contrary. Not saying they don't love the Lord, just saying that we disagree on this issue. I don't, just, don't see that, just don't see that consistent position in Scripture. 2 Peter chapter 2, for example, verses 20 and 21, talking about someone who came to the Lord. For if a person has escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then they become again entangled in the issues of the world, in the sin of the world, in the pollution of the world, and then they're overcome, the latter end of their life will be worse for them than the beginning was. Look at the set, verse 21. For it would have been better for that person never to have known the right, the way of righteousness, than having known it, to turn away from God's holy commandment delivered to them. Do you, do you feel like there's some clarity in that scripture? I mean, I don't see a whole lot of question marks, blatant question marks. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, a few books back to the left. Hebrews 3. And let's look at verses 12 to 14. Hebrews 3. Now, if you know anything about the book of Hebrews, one of the th things that the writer of Hebrews drills down on is drilling down to let us look at the example of the children of Israel as they wandered in the wilderness and use them as an example of everything not to do. He said, if you want to know what not to do, look at the children of Israel and that'll give you a good starting place. Never to use them for an example of anything good. And one of which is Hebrews 3, 12 to 14. Then he says, beware. Now you notice verse 11. As a result of the children of Israel's disobedience, the Lord said, so I swore in my wrath that they will not enter into my rest. That's it, right? He laid a whole generation low in the wilderness. He let them die off. Now with that in mind, Boom, that the Lord, even though he chose the children of Israel to be his people, he got so angry, he was so disgusted that he laid a whole generation low 
that refused to walk in faith and obedience. He let him die. And they did not enter into his rest. Now, with that in mind, he goes into verse 12 and he says, oh, by the way, lest you think you're in a special place and you're nothing like these guys, beware, brethren, lest there be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief. Notice he doesn't just say an evil heart like you do bad things. It's an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now listen, think about the words in here. Beware, brethren. How many of you know that the writer of Hebrews does not call an unbeliever a brother? So he's talking clearly to someone who's among the brethren. Now he says, look, you're a brother in Christ today, but beware, lest because of unbelief, you depart from the living God. How much clear do you have to be that you can depart from the living God? In this case, you cop a bad attitude, you're driven by offenses, you're driven by anger, and you cop a heart of unbelief, and you wind up like this in your own way, and you fall away. He said, beware. Clear warning over against the backdrop of a whole nation being laid low and failing to enter. Verse 13, so to, as a prescription against that, exhort one another daily while it is still called today. Like, don't wait till tomorrow. Encourage someone today. Keep someone accountable today in love because you don't know how close to slipping down the toilet they might be. Lest any of you through, uh, be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And let me tell you, I know some Christians today that are fully involved in sin, fully involved in immorality. And I know they love the Lord at the same time, but they're playing with fire. Look at verse 14 now. For we have become partakers of Christ. What's the next word? Say it again. Yeah. See, things get iffy here. He doesn't say because, he says if. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast, where? To the end. The issue is not starting the Boston Marathon, it's finishing it. You don't get a prize for starting it. If so, I might as well join. Go to uh, 1 John chapter 2. Go back to the right again. Come on, let your fingers do the walking tonight. 1 John chapter 2. Everybody okay? Yeah. Again, this is one of the longest answers, believe me, but I, I'm trying to build a case for you so that, I, so that you know that this position is not just taken out of the sky here but it's got a very clear basis for belief. 1 John 2. You know, if you just think about it logically, just think about it logically for a second, why would God give this glorious heaven to a bunch of stubborn, rebellious people? You know, I wrestled with this idea years ago until I finally got the answer. And this, was the, this is the thing I wrestled with years ago. How could, I remember thinking that this carnal Christian, they're drinking, smoking, swearing, telling crude jokes, and yet they were praising the Lord on Sunday, and I'm trying to wrap my head around seeing people like that throughout the years. With a missionary in Iran that gets beheaded for the sake of the gospel, and they don't care that they're going to get martyred. They're doing it tonight as we speak. How, how could this guy and that guy wind up in the same heaven? Then I realized, well, you know what? Maybe this carnal guy won't get in there after all. But even if he does, the issue is the judgment seat of Christ and the rewards or lack thereof that has to be accounted for in the meantime. 1 John chapter 1, chapter 2, rather, verses 15 to 17. Look at what John says. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, 
It just proves that the love of the Father is not in him. You can't love Jesus and love the world with the same love. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it's of the world. But look at verse 17. And the world is passing away. This world system is passing away, right? This world order is passing away. Well, look what he says. But he who does the will of God is the person that will abide with him forever. Not him who owns a Bible, not him who came to an altar call when he was 16, not him who knows all the terminology, Christianese, but him who does the will of God. He who does the will of God is the one that will abide with him forever. And let's look at one more scripture and we'll stop. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Back to the left again. Hebrews chapter 12. Then I'll give you four or five more scriptures. You can just write the reference down. Hebrews chapter 12. And let's look at verse um, 14. You can also tack on verse 15, but let's begin at verse 14. Look at what the writer of Hebrews says. Pursue peace with all people, and what else? Now, is holiness optional? Is it something that you get around to in your spare time? Is it something relatively low on God's priority scale? No, look what he says. Pursue peace and holiness, without which no one will what? See the Lord. How many of you know there's a scripture that says, be holy as I am holy? Really, the understanding there is you can be holy because I am holy. And I will grace you that if you pursue holiness, you will find it. But this is a priority pursuit. Look at verse 15. He said, looking carefully. That means being very careful lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up within them cause us trouble, and by this root of bitterness, many to be defiled. One of the most dangerous people to be around is an offended Christian. They mess other Christians up, and they think nothing of messing worldly people up more than they already are. With tremendous judgment will follow that kind of activity. But I want to give you these scriptures. You can just write the references down. Second Peter, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 4, verses 10 and 11. 2 Timothy 4, verses 10 and 11. That's where Paul said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. He's gone. Why would Paul mention Demas if, if the reader would never even know who Demas was. Demas clearly was a very well-known guy that completely fell away. Now, do we know whether Demas ever got restored or not? No. But it doesn't mean that we should assume that he did. All we know is that he left Paul and clearly left God because he loved this present world. Luke chapter 12, verses 8 and 9. Luke 12, 8 and 9, Jesus said, whoever confesses me before men, him I will confess before the Father. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny that I knew him before the Father. Done. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3, it's where the scripture says that the Spirit of God will not always strive with the Spirit of man that people will get a window of opportunity, they'll get a window of grace. But if they choose to go their own way, God will not always strive with trying to keep somebody in the saddle. He'll say then, I'll tell you what, then your will be done. And you're on the last train out. And last, Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. It's where Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will wind up entering into the kingdom. 
and they'll give their pedigree. But we got used here. We cast out devils. We spoke in tongues. We did, did, did. And he said, depart from me. Not, he doesn't deny the fact that he used them. But he said, but you lived a lawless life. You set a lawless example for everyone around you. You, you set an example that as long as I believe in him and, and you know, want to be used by God, that I can live the way I want to live and not live an accountable, submitted, obedient life. Whoa. Anyhow, I can give you another 50 scriptures, but you understand the point. If you have a different opinion, knock yourself out. Here's what I would encourage you, though. Don't test the waters. You know, we're told in Scripture, stay close to Jesus and flee from youthful lusts, which weighs war against your soul. You want to snuggle up to it because you believe you're always saved. Then your devil's going to put a hook in your jaw. Don't play with that stuff. Now, second question. What do you think about the mentally disabled and salvation? Can a mentally disabled person be saved? Absolutely. Absolutely. And obviously, the more disabled that they are, listen, they're like children. They're like children. It's very consistent with the mercy of God. It's consistent with the righteousness of God. It's consistent with the heart of God. It's consistent with what Jesus said in Matthew 19, 14. That let the little children come to me, for of such is the kingdom of God. Now, obviously, he wasn't talking about just kids here. He's talking about a childlike attitude of faith and humility and obedience. But you understand the position here is that someone who's disabled, they don't have the faculties that we're talking about here, just like an infant or a little child. In that somewhere in the recesses of the secret things belonging to the Lord, everyone will reach this, this point of, of accountability. But we don't know where that point is. Only the Lord does, but he deals mercifully with people. Right? He's full of mercy, but he's full of truth. He's full of righteousness, and he gives people opportunities to make a right choice. But we're talking about a disabled person. So can they be saved? Absolutely. I believe that they are. Because it's in keeping with the revealed character and nature of God that he's not willing that any should perish. And living in this fallen world and someone has a mental disability that, that truly disables them from making conscious, logical, spiritual, informed decisions, so to speak, I believe that they are clearly in the heart of God. Number three, explain and define prayer. Is there more than one way to pray? Absolutely. Absolutely. Very simply put, prayer is simply talking to God. Man, people like to so complicate prayer. God's pretty smart. He understands multiple languages. He's got Rosetta Stone. He's, he's, uh, <laughs> he's pretty sharp. Well, God doesn't hear the prayers of an unbeliever. Why do you think someone gets saved? You know, there's this theological term called saving grace. And people can split hairs over it. But look, listen, somebody can't come to the Lord just because they feel like it. When someone's in a position and the grace of God overshadows them, she's trying to do this for a visual impact. The grace of God overshadows them and they call upon the name of the Lord in their sin. Of course he hears them. <laughs> if he didn't hear them, nobody would be able to get saved. Because how can we can believe in our heart and then confess with our mouth if everything we confessed he didn't hear because we're still a sinner? Of course he does. But I'll tell you what, what he goes after first is the heart. Notice the order. If you believe in your heart and then confess with your mouth, not just confess with your mouth, but you don't really believe in your heart, you just want an insurance policy from hell. It's not going to work. That's why Dietrich Bonhoeffer called it cheap grace. When someone sells a cheap gospel to someone, just pray this prayer with me. 
Don't you want to be delivered from a certain destiny of destination of hell? Yeah. Just pray this prayer with me then. It's all I have to do? Yes. The Bible says, just believe and confess. Hold on, pal. It says a whole lot more than that. Don't do a CNN soundbite on them. You're going to set them up big time to think that they're all squared away, just like religion does with people. That's what's so dangerous about religion is that people think they're all squared away because they have a certain mental block of six check, you know, check boxes that uh, they know the right answers to. Well, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah. Come on. Come on. I got to get to the bar. Go, go on with your questions. You believe Jesus died on the cross? Well, I suppose so. Yeah, I think that's what we believe. Yeah. What else? That's ridiculous. Those are just games right there. It means nothing. So prayer is simply talking to God. And so when you want to pray, just talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord because it keeps you real. And if you grew up in a religious background, chances are you want to revert back to memorized prayers and you're always going to question yourself, am I praying right? Listen, very simply, just here's the order of prayer. If you want to put an order to it, we pray to the Father in Jesus' name. That means we are allowed to come to the Father because of the blood of Jesus covering us. He gives us a document in the courtroom of heaven to approach the judge. It says, yeah, and then, you know, the judge says, and what are you doing here? Uh, I have a document, Your Honor. Jesus said I could come. Okay, ask of me. So really, in, from a visual standpoint, that's, that's what it is. We come to the Father, we pray to the Father in Jesus' name. That means in Jesus' authority. That means in his shadow. By virtue of his decree, we can come. So, I'll just give you real quick. The word prayer means specifically asking something of God with a worshipful attitude. That's what the word prayer really means in the original languages. It means specifically asking God for things with a worshipful attitude as a motivation. The word supplication, you'll see that term it means asking of the Lord with impassioned urgency and fervor. When you reach a place of supplication, you're asking of the Lord with impassioned urgency and fervor. That's what it means to come in supplication. Intercession means to stand in the gap for or to make a strong petition on someone else's behalf. To stand in the gap for or to make a strong petition for somebody else. You're standing in the gap and making a strong petition for somebody else. And then, of course, you'll see this agreement prayer or the prayer of agreement. It means to stand united in prayer with one or more other persons in agreement on a matter. So those are the four big words that you're going to see in reference to prayer. There are others, but those are really the, the ones that you'll see mainly, all right? So I hope whoever wrote that question, hope that answers it because it's not any more complicated than that. Had this question many times over the years. Do, you know, do we pray to Jesus? Do we pray to... Technically, you pray to the Father, but you're coming in Jesus' name. You're coming in his authority. Now, does he hear your prayer if you happen to pray to Jesus? Of course he does. Understand it's not some kind of chemical formula. There's no... Um, What's the word? There's no jealousy and jockeying for position amongst the Trinity. You don't see the Father too. That jerk broke protocol. <laughs> That's my lane. That's my department. You don't see that happening. Because God looks upon the heart. Let our hearts be right before him. Number four, fourth question. Somebody wrote, is it okay to speak directly to our past loved ones while saying prayer? 
The answer, in short, is no. It's not okay. It's not advised. Here's why. Number one, it's unbiblical. Doesn't mean you're a bad person. It's unbiblical. 1 Timothy 2.5, you can write this scripture. 1 Timothy 2.5 says there's one mediator between God and man, and it's Jesus Christ. You notice that also blows away some religious traditions too. There's no St. Christopher, there's no this, there's no Mary, Virgin Mary, there's no this, there's no hierarchy of saints, there's no hierarchy of angels that you pray to or worship in any way. There's one mediator between you and the Father, and it's Jesus. That's it. I, I hate to burst anyone's theological bubble, but Mary did not do any sort of work in the redemption of mankind. Mary does not do any mediatorial work in terms of prayer. In fact, Hebrews 7.25 says, Jesus ever lives to make intercession for you and I. You want someone praying for you? You got Jesus already praying for you. Amen. Hebrews 7.25. So, is it okay to talk to your dead loved ones? Number one, it's unbiblical. Number two... It can become very spiritually dangerous very quickly. Because what happens if you get some kind of answer? What happens if you hear some kind of voice? And I promise you, if you carry on with it, you will. But it'll be a counterfeit. Don't play with that stuff. It, it's as spiritually dangerous as going to a fortune teller or a psychic or a tarot card reader would be. Let me give you another scripture, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen says, why should we be surprised that Satan can manifest himself as an angel of light? Well, he's nobody to play with, and he can, you know, one of the manifestations of demons is called shapeshifters. This guy can manifest himself as an angel of light even. And deceive many. And third, the reason why the answer is no is that it's really forbidden in Scripture. Because anytime you're talking to the dead, it's called necromancy. Necromancy in the Old Testament, they would go to psychics and mediums to communicate with the dead on their behalf. And it was a cursed activity in Scripture called necromancy. That means communication with the dead give you two scriptures, Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 12, Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 to 12, and 1 Samuel 28 and verse 7. Even King Saul fell into that trap because of desperation. Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 12, 1 Samuel 28 and verse 7. Okay? So the answer is a big N-O. So don't get mad at me. I'll tell you what, it's all in Scripture, and you don't want to play with that stuff. Leave that religious stuff behind, because it's not scriptural. Choose to live by this or religious traditions, but don't do both. And if you've been delivered, stay delivered. Don't get entangled again with some hybrid mutant that you create. Let it go. When you don't know any better, you don't know any better. But once you do, you're accountable for that. Number five, where in the Bible does it discuss Lucifer's time in heaven? Two passages, really. Isaiah 14, verses 10 to 17. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 10 to 17. And Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 11 to 17. <clears throat> Isaiah 14, verses 10 to 17. We'll just look at one of those real quick. We'll go to Isaiah. And Ezekiel 28, 11 through 17. Okay, so we'll go to Isaiah 14. You know, anytime you see something of this nature, it's really prophetic in that it was the prophet was speaking to a real king but the long-term prophetic implication of what he was saying was for Lucifer. And so we see in Isaiah 14, 
In this case, he speaks directly about Lucifer. In Ezekiel 28, he speaks about the king of Tyre. But anyhow, here's here. Isaiah 14, verse 12. said, How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Guess what that term really means? It means day star. You know the amazing thing? Is that Jesus, Peter called Jesus the bright and morning star, otherwise known as the day star. So Lucifer was a counterfeit. But he was filled with the glory of God at one point in time. And notice where he fell from. Not the back of a turnip truck. He fell out of heaven. He didn't really fall. He got the boot. He got the left foot of fellowship. So look what it says. How you have fallen from heaven. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you've been cut down to the ground. You who weakened the nations. How many of you know he still weakens the nations today? People do wicked things because there's a weakening of moral moral constitution. There's a weakening of of things that are right and wrong. There's a weakening in people's resolve to do right. That's why Isaiah said there'll come a time when good will be called evil and evil will be called good. Why? Because there's a weakening of the nations and there's a spirit of deception that comes in place of that weakening. Now look what he says. What was, what was the indictment on Lucifer? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I'm sick of God getting all the glory. I work hard up here. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And here's a, There's a built-in little clue for you and I. You know what it is? Anytime someone is driven by the first word, the personal pronoun, I, nothing good's going to come of it. Whenever somebody said, I'm offended, I, 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 nothing good's going to come of that because they're thinking about themselves. So Lucifer thought, I, and he said, I'm going to lead a coup, and I'm going to overthrow this despot called God. I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit in the mount of the congregation. I will rule and reign, not just him. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And guess what he says next? I will be like the Most High. But look at the judgment. Ah, Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities? who did not open the house of his prisoners. Anyhow, he talks about the fact that you tried it, you got the boot, and now you are judged into the blackness of darkness. Your forwarding address will be the lake of fire. Anyhow, those are the two passages where Lucifer is spoken of. If you put them together, you can see his first home was right around the throne of God, and then he started thinking, I, instead of him destroyed them. Next, what can be said about depression? What kind of help can be given to those who suffered, who have suffered for years with depression? <clears throat> Too many people are bound like a thorn in the flesh that they can't get relief from. Please help. It's a complicated topic, but I will say this. <clears throat> I'm just going to kind of give bullet point prescription. Prayer, consistently sitting under the word, consistently worshiping. These are biblical prescriptions here. Medication, when it's necessary, can help you through a season. Therapy, counseling, recreation. I just read the other day, they just did a a study at Harvard. And they found that, I don't know why this seems like so mind-boggling, but they did this study that said, no, exercising and lifting weights breaks depression because of the things that it releases into your bloodstream. Get into the gym. It'll help your state of mind out. That's the whole point. Do some kind of exercise. It helps your state of mind because of what it releases in your 
natural blood system, but it lifts your mentality is the point. Get active. So prayer, sitting under the word. Be a worshiper. Medication, therapy, recreation. You got to do stuff that's fun. Be careful of the confession of your tongue. Because no matter what, when you violate Proverbs 18, 21, that death and life are in the power of the tongue, when you violate that, you're going to eat the fruit of that. And if you keep saying, nothing's ever going to change for me, nothing's ever going to change for me, it's not going to change for you. You know what? There are some principles in the word that if you violate them, God is not going to supersede those principles. Because you can read those things, and yet, as, even as a Christian, you're choosing to speak deaf and speak about illnesses and sicknesses and depression. And, uh, and, uh. Listen, the Bible's clear. However you use your words and your tongue, you're going to eat the fruit of that. In other words, it's going to make your problem worse than it already is. You don't live in denial that you have an issue, but don't make it worse than it is. Serving others. Serving others is a beautiful way to keep your mind off yourself. If you're not serving others, you're going to be thinking about your problem. Let's face it, you will be. You'll either be going to work and thinking about the problem there, or then when you get out, you're thinking about your problem there too. you got to put on the armor of God, and you got to start fighting. Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. Put on the armor of God. Listen, the Lord will fight for you, but at some point, he's going to say, no, you need to stand and learn to fight. I'm going to keep allowing this until you rise up, take the anointing and the authority that I've given you in Christ, and start to fight. Because if you don't care about it, neither do I. How many of you know that we have to fight temptation? We have to fight this, we have to fight that, but nothing out there, no action will take place on its own out of a vacuum. It's always preceded by thoughts left unattended. So you've got to take authority over your thought realm, 2 Corinthians 10. And last but not least, this can also be understood as part of the weakness of this bodily construction, this side of glory, this bodily uh, constitution, I would say, this side of glory, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 44. This, that issue is <clears throat> in line with many other issues that goes in, in line with the fact that in this tabernacle, in this weak vessel, we're going to have problems. And that's one of them. That's why the Apostle Paul said, when this body dies, it is sown in weakness, but it's raised in power. It's sown in dishonor, but it'll be raised in glory. It may be sown subject to all kinds of weaknesses and infirmities, but it will be raised imperishable. So the issue is always looking forward to glory. So in the meantime, we're going to struggle with some things along the way. It doesn't make you a bad Christian. It doesn't make you a bad person. But you got to make sure that you're doing your part. Otherwise, we're just going to talk about the problem for the rest of our life. Everybody okay? Okay. Okay, I want to do a short one and then get back to this. <clears throat> Somebody wrote, <clears throat> I know that if, that if we sing our own praises, quote unquote, after we bless someone, it is vain glory. But if someone blesses me and I share that with others, because I'm overwhelmed with joy, does that fall under the same category? The answer is no. If you bless someone with this or that, and you give this $10, $10, $20, whatever, and then you make sure you tell 50 people what great things you've done, that's vain glory. And you have your reward, that's it. But if somebody blesses you, and then you go talking about it, 
That's not the same thing at all. You got to make sure you're giving glory to God in the process, but let's assume that that's exactly what you're doing. It says in Psalm 105, verse 1, Hallelujah, thank the Lord, call upon his name, tell everyone you meet what great things he has done. I think that's pretty good, isn't it? Tell everyone you meet what great things he has done. I want to give you two other scriptures. Psalm 71 and verse 17. Psalm 71 and verse 17. I like this psalm. It says this. Psalm 71, 17. It says, O oh God, you have taught me from my youth, and to this day I will declare your wondrous works. And last, Psalm 86, verses 9 and 10. Psalm 86, verses 9 and 10 says this. All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. So it's great to talk about the works of the Lord. Not only is it not wrong, it's right, because we're told to make, to make known his wondrous works. And the Bible encourages us to declare God's faithfulness to others and to speak of his wondrous acts. It glorifies his name and it actually acts as a faith builder for your brothers and sisters in Christ. So it's not wrong, it's right. Okay? Now, I'll read this next question. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, to the woman, after the fall of Adam and Eve, when the Lord came knocking, to the woman, he said, I will bring your pains in childbearing very severe with painful labor. In painful labor, you will give birth to children. So the question is, is Eve the start of why giving birth is so painful? The answer is yes. So ladies, you know who you can blame. <laughs> the answer is yes. That's part of the judgment. That's just a part of it. Why? Because the pain was to serve as a constant reminder that the woman who was the one was the one who gave birth to sin in the entire human race. And now genetically passes this on to all the other children. Because David said in Psalm 51 that part of the revelation he got was that he was conceived in sin. That he was a sinful person at birth. So it goes all the way back to Eve. So the point is this. The Lord said you're going to give birth, but you're going to give birth in painful childbirth because it was to serve as a constant reminder that the woman gave birth to sin for the entire human race, and then she passed it on genetically to her children. However, the good news is, in that same judgment, the Lord also gives a way of deliverance. So the Bible says that she can be delivered, so to speak, from that curse by raising godly children. How many of you know that the mother typically spends a lot more nurturing and constructive time with the children than the father typically does? It's the mother that typically is with the child each day, and, you know, when he skins her knee, his knee, or, or they, you know, she gets hurt, or the, it's the mother that usually is working him through the challenges and the scrapes and, and all that kind of stuff, and, you know, praying over them and all that stuff. It's good that the father's involved, but the mother typically has more of the nurturing kind of contact. And so part of the, the redeeming process in this whole thing is that she can be delivered by raising godly children. She Now think about this, because part of what the Lord said to Eve after he talked about the pain in childbirth was, and down the road, you're going to give birth, and when you give birth, he's going to crush Satan's head. And Satan will but bruise his heel. So guess what? The Lord was saying, but I'm going to use you to give birth. And the ultimate birth will be for the one who corrects what you've messed up. Guess what that was called? The last Adam. The first Adam messed it up. The last Adam straightened it out. 
So God also used that same woman who introduced sin to give birth to the seed that crushed Satan's head. Um, why don't you just look at 1 Timothy 2.15 real quick. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 15. Because this is where it's really referred to in the New Testament. 1 Timothy 2.15. You see in verse 14, it says, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But you see the first word in verse 15, nevertheless, that means, but there's a way out. And what it says, nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing or through the process of bringing forth children into the world if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. That means when a woman does her job well, when a mother does her job well, and those kids grow up to love the Lord and live for him, it's going to be a consistent kick in the teeth to the devil to make him feel sorry that he ever messed with the woman. She can't go back to the Garden of Eden and straighten that out. But don't forget, God used Mary to give birth to the Messiah. And so... Women nowadays, the the greatest thing they can do is raise godly children through that pain because the pain represents the curse, but raising a godly child represents the blessing that offsets the curse. That make sense to you? So that's the greatest antidote to the curse is to raise godly children and they kick the devil in the teeth. Wow, and our time is running out. Okay, let's, let's do one or two more. Is that okay? Give me five minutes. What does Matthew 7 and verse 6 mean? Yeah, I don't know. I haven't read that. <laughs> Matthew 7 and verse 6. Jesus said, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and they dare turn and tear you to pieces. So what does that really mean? Well, that verse, in the context of the passage, when you read the whole passage, because he starts out by saying, judge not, lest you be judged. Some Christians take that to mean, I should never judge anything. But that's not what he's saying. So let me give you some bullet points about what the passage means, and then I'll get to verse 6, because it has a setting, all right? It has a setting from which it comes out of. The first thing Jesus is talking about is that we are to judge certain things in life, but we are not to make judgmentalism a way of life. Because if you don't judge things, you're going to be a spineless noodle, And you're going to consider that walking in love? I mean, it's a big saying now. In Hollywood and everything, who am I to judge? But who am I to judge? Nobody wants to judge anything on any basis. Why? Because it's the death of absolute truth. It's this moral relativism and political correctness insanity that's gotten people scared to death to say anything about anything. Now employers... If you say something, you know, you get fired for saying the first little thing. It's madness. So we're to judge certain things, but we're not to make judgmentalism the way of life. Second, we should always consider with grace toward others the condition of our own lives. That's why Jesus is talking about the fact that, you know, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye when you're not even considering the plank, the two-by-four that's in your own eye. That means you're nitpicking this person's life, and you got a two-by-four coming out of your own eye. So what he's saying there is that we've got to consider with grace toward others the condition of our own lives in reference to what we're about to say to them, and if we should say it at all. Number three we got to realize, now this is where it's getting down into verse 6 now, where Jesus is talking about don't take what's holy and throw it to the dogs and all this kind of stuff. 
we got to realize that when we're following Jesus and following the Bible in this world, that that reality is going to be convicting to people in reference to the sin that's in their life. Hello? How many of you know you can be in a room with 10 religious people, you can all check the boxes that you're all Christians on a survey form, but if you're the only born-again Christian in there, you're the only real Christian in that room. And you're going to be living stuff out that's going to be very foreign to them. And if you're going to put the heat on in terms of righteous living, it can convict. And they can start to dislike you just because the Spirit of God in you convicts them of sin and hypocrisy. So you've got to be careful that when you're serving Jesus and you're following the Bible in this world, that that's what's going to convict people. However... What Jesus is saying is that given the fact that we're going to be judged, mocked, ridiculed, or whatever, or criticized for following the Lord in the way that we are, we must consistently strive never to live hypocritical lives, thus giving our detractors real places of accusation. Now, the next thing that he's saying in this passage is that in the light of preaching the gospel as we live life, we are to be accurately judging, assessing, and evaluating, uh, spiritually evaluating people, situations, and opportunities along the way. So you, if you're hearing from the Spirit of God, you're going to be assessing and evaluating things from a spiritual standpoint every day. Now, for example, if it's true that we're never to judge on any basis. Remember what Jesus said? That when you go preaching over here, if they won't hear you, shake the dust off your feet. That's a judgment. You're judging. You're shaking the dust off your feet and moving to the next location to preach. Does that make sense to you? And don't forget, it's also in reference to do not give what's holy to the dogs, etc. Verse 6 that we're talking about. We're told in Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 8. Now we're specifically zeroing in verse 6. Don't give what's holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine. What he means by that verse is that sometimes we've got to shake the dust off our feet. Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 8 tells us, do not rebuke a mocker or he'll hate you. Rebuke a wise man, and he'll love you even more. So when I get around someone who has a mocking spirit, and I see that what they're about to do is wrong, or, you know, I, I know I can give them a word that would help them if they would listen to it, but it's coming from the Scriptures. Now, I don't even have to use a verse, chapter and verse, but I know they have such a mocking, know-it-all spirit, I'm not even going to waste the time. They won't receive it anyhow. They think they know everything anyhow, and they got a mocking spirit. I'm not going to take that which is holy and cast it before the dogs. That's why it says, don't bother rebuking a mocker, a know-it-all, a big mouth, or they're just going to turn around and hate you. The only place where a rebuke works is when someone is open and teachable. They might get mad at you at first, but then when they calm down, they say, you know what, you were right. Even if they say it to themselves, yeah, that was right. What? That speaks well of that person because they're teachable. But when someone's a know-it-all, I don't bother. I don't bother rebuking them. I don't bother correcting them. Why? That's a judgment that we're allowed to make. Thus, on that basis, we're told never to give what's sacred, literally, to pigs and mockers. And in one last scripture we'll look at together. Can we do that? And then we're finished. Acts chapter um, 13. Acts chapter 13.
You know, and the whole idea there, when you talk about uh, that, that scripture, the idea was that dogs would go wild and that pigs would very often, if you threw, you know, the pearls before swine, they would go crazy after it thinking it was food. And when a pig is hungry and they don't get food, they can get vicious. And a dog will turn on you and tear you to pieces too. So you got to be careful what you put out there in front of certain people. Now, Acts 13. Look with me at verse 44. This is when the apostles were at Antioch. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear a word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were what? Filled with envy. And contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed. You see the mocking spirit here? They opposed everything that Paul was preaching about. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it's necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it, so there's, a, there's kingdoms and conflict going on right here. They're rebuking these clowns. This word was meant for you, but now that you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we will now turn to the Gentiles. Woo. Verse 47, for, for so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Now look at this. Now, when the Gentiles heard this, see how teachable they were? They were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. But the Jews worked every which way against the gospel. And they claimed to know the Bible. And as many as been appointed to eternal life believed the apostles, and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout the whole region. But the Jews, what did they do? They stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raising up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. But Paul and Barnabas shook the dust off their feet against them and they went on to Iconium. You see, when they brought a good truth in front of mockers, what did the mockers do? Stirred up trouble, tried to get them killed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's the epitome of Matthew 7 and verse 6. That's how it plays out in real life. You got to be careful who the, you share the gospel in front of. Be careful how far you go. Be careful the settings in which you share. If there's three people in front of you, one of them is really open, your sensing is really open, and the other two have a mocking spirit, Pray, pray, pray that the Holy Spirit would get rid of these two knuckleheads so you can get some alone time with the person who's open. Because every word that comes out of your mouth, they could be working. If nothing else, they'd be working in the Spirit against you right to your face. Right? That, what do you think it means to be wise as serpents? Be harmless, innocent as doves. But you've got to first be wise as a serpent. Thank you so much for joining us today. If God has impacted your life through this message, please join Victory in reaching people all around the world by sowing back into the kingdom today. You can give at rvictory.org slash give or download the Victory Church app and select give. Find Victory on social media for bonus teachings and content all throughout the week. 